this lesson is going to focus on one of the most foundational skills you'll need to build to improve your performance on the GMAT focus quantitative section in particular, mental math and manual calculation abilities. So let's start just by be discussing how calculation is structured within the new GMAT focus structure. So we know that the quantitative reasoning section will still not allow a calculator. So there's not an interface calculator, you're not allowed to bring your own. But even though no calculator is provided, the GMAC, the people who put forth the GMAT focus, do not necessarily value manual calculation as a premium skill. They just kind of expect that GMAT test takers will be able to do your basic four function calculations and then be able to manipulate numbers that are non-integers and exponential in format as a baseline skill. But that said, the calculations in the quantitative reasoning should produce relatively clean results or be approximated or be able to track directly to some answer choices. So they won't just ask for you arbitrarily to divide 7,333,412 by 86 and expect you to do some really crazy non-integer result. They're just going to ask you to be able to do the basics that um, a skilled person who's able to use arithmetic will be able to execute in, say, a business setting. Now, in the new data insight section, there is a difference. They will provide an interface calculator. This is the same as when they used to have the integrated reasoning section on the legacy GMAT. And the biggest tip for the data insight section and the integrated reasoning questions that are there in the data insights section that leverage math is they do expect to use this calculator. So definitely use it as a resource for clumsy or convoluted calculations so that you're not wasting time trying to manually calculate when it's unnecessary to do so. So definitely remember that that calculator exists on the data insights section. So strategically, this is the first ability you'll need to develop to achieve your GMAT score goals because without a native expeditious ability to work through the math, you're really going to have a hard time achieving a score that is going to be uh, leading you to ultimate admission success on the quantitative reasoning section. And you can practice this skill with some freely available tools on the internet at math-aids.com that we'll be talking about later on in this lesson, just to improve your speed and accuracy, because it's not exciting. But if you're able to do your average calculation in closer to 10 seconds, as opposed to 20 seconds, just by doing more drills, you will improve your ability to get through that quantitative reasoning section in a efficient manner. So how do we manage mental math and manual calculation? Well, first, we want to use easy factors or multiples. And those are going to be factors of two, five, 10, 100 and a half. And you may have thought to yourself, yeah, I can usually have things, double things relatively easily. I can divide by five, divide by 10. And why is that? Well, it's, the, it's our biology. We've got two hands, five fingers and 10 tones. And that is the basis of decimal math. That's why our brains are just able to do that math more natively and naturally. So let's talk about doubling and halving first. So if each digit in a number is less than or equal to four, you could simply double each digit. So for instance, 24 times two is 48. Two times two is four. Four times two is eight. Easy enough. Even something like 204 times two, that's going to be 408 because two times two is four. Zero times zero remains zero. And four times two is eight. <clears throat> but if any digit is greater than four, you have to double the leftmost digit first and then work towards the units digit. So for instance, 596 times 2, well, that's going to be 500 times 2, plus 90 times 2, plus 6 times 2. So 500 times 2 becomes 1,000, 90 times 2 becomes 180, and 6 times 2 becomes 12. And we add all of that together to find that 1,000 plus 180 is 1,180. 1,180 plus 12 is 1,192. And if the units digit is even, you can actually divide your leftmost digit by 2. Uh, and then work towards the units as well. So for instance, 476 divided by two, well, I could divide 400 by two, add that to 70 divided by two, add that to six divided by two. So I know that 476 divided by two is 200 plus 35 plus three, which is going to give me 238. And of course, if your units digit is not even, 
you end up with a half. So then let's talk about manipulating by factors of 10. So if you multiply by 10, you shift the decimal one place right. So for instance, 2.3 times 10 becomes 23. 23 times 10 becomes 230. If you are multiplying by 10 to the nth power, then you just shift the decimal n places to the right. So you can see that already playing out in the prior example because 10 to the first is 10. So we just shift one place to the right in the previous examples. Or if we're looking at 2.3 times 10 to the second or 100, we shift that two places to the right. So that becomes 230. If we did 2.3 times 10 to the sixth or 1 million, that would be shifting six places to the right. And you go from 2.3 to 2,300,000 if you multiplied it 2.3 times 1 million. And then we've got dividing by 10 to the nth means just shift the decimal n places left. So it's basically in reverse. So if we did 590 divided by 10 or 10 to the first, you'd be left with 59. 590 divided by 100 would shift the decimal left two places to 5.9. And if we did 590 divided by 10,000 or 10 to the fourth power, that would shift the decimal left four places, which gives us 0 0.059 as the result of that division. <clears throat> now, you can always expedite addition and subtraction by seeking factors of 10 as well. So if you're looking at, say, 484 plus 72, you could shift 2 from 480 to 484 from 72 and reimagine that as 486 plus 70 because it's the exact same. And then you're just going to have your units digit remain as a 6 because when you have a 0 in your units digit, it doesn't change the units digit. And then you sum the 100s and the 10s digit and we end up with 55 as 48 plus 7. So we end up with 486 plus 70 is 556. Similarly, if we're doing it with subtraction, we could subtract one from each of the values of 973 minus 81 to reimagine that as 972 minus 80. The units digit, once again, will remain a two because you're subtracting an 80 and that zero in the units digit means there is no change to the units digit. Then you subtract the hundreds and tens of digits again. So 97 minus eight is gonna be 89 and that's gonna be my 892 because we kept the two from the units digit is the result of 973 minus 81. Now you can also expedite multiplication by seeking similar factors of 10. So 48 times 72, you might be able to recognize that the easiest multiple of 10 is near 48 is 50. So I could just say 72 times 100 is 7,200 and half of that product is gonna be 72 times 50. So I know that 72 divided by 2, or 3,600, is going to be equal to 72 times 50. Now, I just have to subtract two 72s to get to 48 72s. And 72 times 2, 70 times 2 is 140. 2 times 2 is 4, so 72 times 2 is 144. And we'll subtract that 144 from the 3,600, which was our 72 times 50, to get to the result of 72 times 48. So 72 times 50 minus 72 times 2 is 72 times 50 minus 2, if you were to factor it out, which is my 72 times 48. And 3,600 minus 100 minus 44 is going to give us 3,456, which is equal to 48 times 72, which was our original product that was sought. And this, again, is just leaning into our natural instincts for math, as opposed to necessarily doing it all on the scratch pad in the somewhat less intuitive for many people way of manually calculating multiplication or division. Because yes, you can do this all written out, but our brains just tend to process the math more easily as those factors of two, five, 10, 100 and a half. And this is a skill that the exam definitely rewards. So let's talk about long division. You can manually manipulate long division. It's really just bad marketing. Long division doesn't take that long. So let's take a look at an example of long division, something such as 24 going into 5,520. So 24 goes into 55 twice. We then multiply that two by 24 to get 48 and we subtract that out of the 55, leaving behind a seven and then we drop down the two and we see now that 24 will go into 72 exactly three times. And then we have to subtract out that 72 that we counted. and then 
we have a zero that's left over and 24 obviously goes into zero, zero times. We bring up that final digit of a zero to find that 5520 divided by 24 is equal to 230 in the end. And once more, the long division, it sounds like it's going to take a long time, but because you're ultimately chopping it into smaller pieces, it doesn't really take that long, most folks. So we mentioned this resource earlier, mathaids.com. It is a free online resource where you can just get a bunch of manual calculation drills. They're dynamically produced worksheets, so you'll never see the same worksheet twice, and it's going to cover all GMAT calculation topics. So how we use these, you want to rotate two to five worksheets a day, minimum of five to 20 minutes. And really, that's kind of the maximum. You don't need to spend a ton of time working through mathaids.com drills, but it's a great warm up for any GMAT practice. Now, you will want to focus on areas of difficulty more frequently. So you just want to make sure that you're covering the stuff that you're struggling with. Don't, again, lean into human instincts, which is I do the stuff I like to do. Focus on the ones where you're having trouble. You can practice both written manual calculation and mental math. If you're having trouble keeping the numbers in your mind, put them on the scratch pad, put them on your notebook, and that will build the skill in time. You can always do this as a warm up before any real GMAT quantitative practice drills or exams in this course in the official MBA.com practice resources. Again, is just a great way to warm up your mind. You wouldn't take part in any other skill, skills based activity without any sort of warm up. You would not play a musical instrument without running some scales first. You would not go out onto a football field or a baseball field or a basketball court and not stretch first. So that's how you can use this very effectively. And you want to begin with what we call our top six mathaids.com topics. And we'll take a look at those here in a moment as well. But you can always use the search box to locate specific content drills that are outside of this top six. So if you're on the website, there's a little search box at the very top right hand corner. Once you get past a couple of pop-ups, it does have some pop-ups because it's a free resource that's probably older than most GMAT candidates these days. But you can always search for things like inequalities or word problems, other topics that you know you need to work on. If you use that search box, you'll probably find it on mathaids.com. And you have to be aware, don't go into the higher end difficulty things. There are topics around trigonometry and calculus that are on mathaids.com that are not relevant to this exam. There is absolutely no reason for you to start fiddling around in, say, Algebra 2. So our top six topics. For multiplication, you want to cover your times tables, advanced time drills, and your single or multiple digit multiplication worksheets. Just really executing on the approaches that we talked about moments ago. Now, you'll also want to cover division. And in division, you'll want to do some long division worksheets. And you'll also want to do the times tables, time drills worksheets. So very similar to the multiplication. Then you've got your exponents and radicals. You'll want to do exponents with multiplication and division, and you'll want to learn and practice how to simplify radicals. And we'll have some more discussions around exponents and radicals in an upcoming lesson here, but they are another manual calculation skill that the exam is basically going to expect you to be able to manage. And you will generally, and I use the term memorize loosely here, memorization is actually the worst way to do the math because you can incorrectly recall things in the moment. Whereas if instead of saying, eight times nine, I've memorized that as 72. You can always do eight times 10, which is 80, and minus one eight to get down to 72. And that's a better way to do it. But ultimately, you're going to be responsible for knowing your times tables and exponents up to 15 squared and 10 cubed so that you aren't trying to manually work through six cubed, for instance, which could come up on the exam from a manual perspective on the test day. Then we get to our non-integer math aids topics, starting with fractions. So adding and subtracting three fraction worksheets are a good starting point there, along with multiplying fractions with cross canceling, because when it comes to fractions, and again, in the future lesson, we'll discuss in greater detail how to manage fractions. It can very often be more efficient to not manually just go left to right, but actually seek out those cancellation opportunities for managing your fractions. Then we've got decimals, and you're going to want to add and subtract with decimals. And multiplying by powers of 10 with decimals, because once more, we generally will conceptualize math more easily as integers. 
So because of that, we may actually want to eliminate decimals as the best way to process decimals on this test. And then for percentages, you'll want to use percentage calculation worksheets. Now it's a weird thing. They actually use the term percent, not percentage in mathaids.com. It's just a nomenclature thing that they've got, but it then says percentages later on. It's, it's a free website ultimately. And then in the word problem subheading, you'll find percentage word problems because obviously percentages are one of the more commonly tested word problem aspects of the exam. And ultimately, you want to become what we call math ambidextrous for the GMAT focus. You want to be able to do your manual manipulations in the form of the question and most importantly, the answer. So if your answer choices are in fraction, you don't want to be converting everything to decimal. If your answer choices use percentages, you may want to convert those, per those fractions in the problem into percentages to more efficiently get to the format of the answer choices. And by being that ambidextrous, you will, you will not have to spend the extra time that other candidates are translating into their more favorite non-integer format. So that's the starting point of everything when it comes to the quantitative reasoning section of the GMAT focus, manual calculation and mental math. Go ahead and pop over to mathaids.com to take a look at some of those worksheets and begin what will be a process throughout your GMAT focus prep of improving your abilities with manual arithmetic.